CRISPR, bringing extinct species back from the dead. The sixth mass extinction on Earth is now occurring. Thanks largely to humans, between 30 and 159 species go extinct every day, and more than 300 different species of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians have disappeared since 1500. The future of life on our planet does not look promising given these rates, but what if extinction wasn't permanent? What if some of the species we've lost could be resurrected? We're glad you're here. Are you ready to discover the most incredible future applications of CRISPR gene editing technology? We will talk about three astounding possibilities in this video. We'll examine how CRISPR might influence the future, from bringing back extinct species to altering the human DNA to cure diseases in incredible ways. Before we begin, let's preview the three subjects we'll be covering. 1. Bringing extinct species back to life. 2 using CRISPR to cure diseases and extend human lifespan, and three, the ethical considerations of gene modification. Researchers concur that it's time to start seriously considering which animals we might be able to bring back and which ones would do the most good for the ecosystems they left behind. For years, the idea of de-extinction scuttled on the edge of science, but recent developments in genetic engineering, particularly the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution, have changed that. In fact, ecologists from UCSB published recommendations for how to choose which species to resurrect if we want to have the most beneficial effect on the ecosystems of our world. The technology is extensively used in animals. CRISPR has produced disease, resistant chickens, and hornless dairy cattle. Scientists around the world routinely edit the genes in mice for research in a search of possible cures. CRISPR revamped pigs contain kidneys that scientists hope to test as transplants in humans. CRISPR has been agitated as aid extinction tool since its foremost days. In March 2013, the conservation group Revive and Restore co-organized a first TEDx de-extinction conference in Washington, D.C. Revive and Restore was co-founded by Stuart Brand creator of the counterculture Whole Earth Roster and an oral advocate for a passenger pigeon revival. At the conference, George Church, a CRISPR colonist and geneticist at Harvard Medical School, laid out a scientific roadmap for reviving a species. Church concentrated not on the passenger pigeon but on his own pet project, the woolly mammoth. Scientists, Church explained, had partly sequenced the mammoth's genome using DNA extracted from ancient bones and other remains. Armed with that information, they could use CRISPR to edit DNA from the Asian elephant, the mammoth's closest living relative. Through inheritable cutting and pasting, physical and behavioral traits of the mammoth, its namesake coat, and capability to withstand sub-zero temperatures could be added to living elephant cells. In January 2013, scientists printed papers showing that, for the first time, they had successfully edited mortal and animal cells using CRISPR. The news scintillated fears of so, called designer babies edited for traits like brain power and athleticism. Something scientists say is still far out because of the convolution of those traits. But editing of embryos for research is formerly underway. In the past 18 months, researchers in the US and China successfully edited disease, causing mutations in feasible human embryos not intended for implant or birth. The foremost step was to sequence the passenger pigeon genome. The project was led by Beth Shapiro, a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the author of the book, How to Clone a Mammoth. Shapiro's lab studies the DNA of defunct creatures, rooting fragments from bones and other remains, some dating back hundreds of thousands of years. Novak abutted the lab in 2013 to work on the Passenger Pigeon Project. Revive and Restore funded his work. It is not easy to sequence the genome of an extinct species. The DNA in an organism's cells starts to deteriorate when it dies, leaving scientists with what Shapiro describes as a soup of trillions of tiny fragments that need to be put back together. Shapiro and her team collected tissue samples from the toe pads of stuffed birds found in museum collections for the Passenger Pigeon Project. DNA in the dead tissue left them with tantalizing clues, but an incomplete picture. To fill in the gaps, they sequenced the genome of the band-tailed pigeon, the Passenger Pigeon's closest living relative. 
Researchers began to understand which traits distinguished the passenger pigeon by comparing the genomes of the two birds. In a paper published last year in Science, they reported finding 32 genes that made the species unique. Some of these allowed the birds to withstand stress and disease, necessitous traits for a species that lived in large flocks. They found no genes that might have led to extinction. Passenger pigeons went defunct because people hunted them to death, Shapiro says. What are the risks? The spread of genes can be difficult to control. We assumably will not lose track of mammoths in Siberia, but what about rats? If we lose sight of the true gravity of demolishment and overzealously embrace de-extinction as a mitigation tool, it would be truly easy to manufacture timbers, savannas, and abysses full of Franken species and eco-zombies, Macaulay says. But in spite of any danger, Macaulay says his biggest concern is not a raw inheritable trial wreaking havoc on a fragile ecosystem. Actually, the thing that scares me most is that the public absorbs the misimpression that extinction is no longer scary, he says. That the mindset becomes deforest, no biggie, we can reforest. However, no biggie, we can de-extinct it if we drive something extinct. Introducing a new species to a habitat always comes with some risk, but de-extinction scientists point out that we have been suitable to manage that risk successfully with living creatures like reintroducing wolves into Yellowstone National Park or beavers into the United Kingdom. There have also been disasters, like the poisonous cane toad in Australia, which was primarily imported to help control the gray, backed cane beetles that were damaging sugar crops, but is now spreading across the continent and depleting native populations. Regardless, de-extinction is speeding closer to reality, and now is the time to start thinking about it, Macaulay says. For a long time, it was easy to just put it away because the technology was not there, he says, but I do not think we can do that anymore. That's all for today. If you are further interested to know more about using CRISPR to cure diseases and extend human lifespan and the ethical considerations of gene modification, watch our next videos, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out any opportunity.